Chicago's only castle, often called the castle, sometimes called the Irish castle or Givens castle, is hidden away in the Beverly neighborhood of Chicago at 10244 South Longwood Drive. Except for people living in the community, many Chicagoans have never heard of it or have never seen it. It is part of the Longwood Drive district of the Chicago Landmarks Commission. It looks like a real medieval castle. Such castles were three stories high, made of stone or brick, and have towers with battlements, also called crenellations, which look like a series of teeth with gaps between them at the top of the walls where lookouts and archers could hide to spot friend or foe. In the castle's long history from 1886, there were only five keepers. The Givens family, Julia Thayer and her Chicago Female College, the Burdett family, the Siemens family, and Beverly Unitarian Church. The history of Chicago's only castle begins with Robert C. Givens, the inspiration behind the building of the castle, who was a teenager when he came to Chicago from Toronto in 1863. Although he studied law here, his primary profession was real estate developer. He became a partner in the well-known firm of E.A. Cummings & Company. That firm was responsible for dividing and selling over 100 subdivisions in and around Chicago and in other states such as California and Florida as well. Givens was a founder of the Chicago Real Estate Board in 1883 and its vice president in 1894. The board is now called the Chicago Association of Realtors. He was credited with allowing people to buy properties on time, paying a little each month. To interest prospective buyers, he held fairs with a band playing and he would give away a property deed attached to a hydrogen balloon to anyone who found it. On some occasions, his firm hired an aeronaut to fly a large balloon and to drop a property deed. One of his fares took place in the then town of Morgan Park. The Rock Island Railroad created a station at about what is now 109th Place and Vincennes, called Givens, and transported about 2,000 people there to enjoy the afternoon and purchase lots. Givens was involved in the opening ceremonies of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. He launched one of his gas-filled toy balloons with a deed to a Chicago property attached. The balloon, with deed, was likely never found because it was last seen passing over Lake Michigan, about 60 miles from Chicago. He also investigated the movable sidewalk at the 1893 fair to see if it could be used to transport people in downtown Chicago. The sidewalk was a great attraction at the fair. It could hold 6,000 people both sitting and standing at a time. Unfortunately, it broke down too often. Givens purchased the property where the castle is located from William Barnard in 1886, and the magnificent edifice was built on the Blue Island Ridge at what is now 10244 South Longwood Drive in the Washington Heights suburb. That area was annexed by Chicago in 1890. The view of the castle from the Barnard seed farm down below must have been awe-inspiring. The original property was nearly four acres, about twice the size of the current lot. Construction of the castle was mentioned in the Chicago Inner Ocean newspaper of January 1, 1887. On the Dummy Line branch of the Rock Island Road is Tracy Heights, the home of R.C. Givens of the firm of E.A. Cummings, who is building a beautiful, picturesque residence on the hill near Tracy Station. Many legends exist about the castle, such as that given sketched a similar castle on a trip to his ancestral Ireland, there is no evidence of that being true. Of course, he would have seen the castle-like structures also built of Joliet limestone already in Chicago at the time, such as the water tower, 
the entrance to Rose Hill Cemetery, where he had plots, and the Palmer Mansion on North Lakeshore Drive, which was built from 1882 to 1885, but was torn down in 1950. Givens had the castle built for his second wife, Emma Steen. First wife Sophie died in 1883. Emma's parents were immigrants from Norway. In 1887, Robert, age 41, Emma, age 28, and Robert's and first wife's son, Robert Saltern Givens, who was about 16 years old then, moved into the castle. There are people who believe Givens built the castle to enhance his real estate business. On the other hand, he was said to like living away from the hustle-bustle, noise and pollution of the city where he had an office. He could get downtown on the Rock Island Railroad, which had a station, Tracy, on its dummy line about a block from the castle, just east of the bottom of the hill. The stonemason who built the castle was Peter Millen. He had a stone yard nearby the Rock Island Main Line at 103rd Street and Vincennes. The Joliet limestone was delivered by Rock Island to that station, where Millen hauled it to his yard and cut it to size. Then his men transported the limestone by horse-driven wagons to the castle property, about a mile or so from the station. Robert Givens' father was Reverend Saltern Givens. It is surprising that until recently very few people knew who Reverend Givens was. A stained glass window above the fireplace mantel on the second floor is in his memory. Also on this window is the family coat of arms. Robert C. Givens, the showman, sponsored a bicycle race in 1896, perhaps to entice people to purchase lots. At the time, Chicago was the major manufacturer of bicycles. Julian Pye Bliss, a famous Chicago bike racer, won the race, and about 2,000 people watched. Attendees received free train rides. During the years the castle was owned by Givens, from 1886 to 1909, periodically Emma and he lived in the Lexington Hotel, closer to downtown, at 21st and Michigan. It was not unusual for wealthy people to live there during difficult financial times. Moreover, living in the castle would not have been easy for Givens since he had rheumatoid arthritis. The Lexington had elevators, so walking up and down the stairs would not be a problem. Givens was a true Renaissance man. He wrote several popular novels, including The Millionaire Tramp, The Rich Man's Fool, Jones Abroad, and A Thousand Miles an Hour. He was a citizen's advocate, fighting against unfair assessments to homeowners. He formed a group called NSNF, or No Seat, No Fare, that fought against the high fares charged by the cable car companies, and he fought for heated cars. He was a world traveler. He wrote amusing articles about his travels for the Chicago Evening Post. One story was about the insufficient heat and inefficient elevators at the Metropole Hotel in London, where Emma and Robert stayed for a time in 1892. One notices a vast difference in the manner of living here, especially in the hotels, and were it not for the ingenuity of Americans, London hotel life would be decidedly uncomfortable. In cold weather, they heat the bedrooms by a little insignificant soft coal grate, using coal far worse than the poorest quality of our Illinois. The heat derived from this system is equal to that of one match in a town hall. Until quite recently, they did not use elevators. Now the lift is running, but so slowly that the bellboy runs upstairs, opens your door, lights the candles, and waits five minutes till you arrive. Givens loved his adopted city of Chicago. He formed the Two Million Club to spread the news that Chicago was the leading commercial city throughout the United States, and that its population had reached two million in 1893. Of course, the U.S. Census Bureau had a much lower count, and the city would have to wait until 1910 to reach the two million milestone. 
In 1897, Gibbon's image appeared on the front page of the Chicago Eagle newspaper with the caption of the well-known real estate man talked of for mayor. He did consider running for mayor. His platform included being against department stores since he felt they did not pay their fair share of taxes and were ruining the retail business of the city. He was opposed to the special assessment system and for establishing a committee to secure new industries for the city. The second castle keeper was Julia Thayer, who in 1895 housed the Chicago Female College in the castle. It was a premier secondary school for young women that prepared students for such colleges as the University of Chicago. The school was started by Julia's father in 1875. After his death, Julia became president and rented the castle long enough for the Chicago Female College to have two academic years there. Julia Thayer was also a poet. The tenure of the Chicago Female College is important because Thayer had photographs taken for the college's illustrated brochure, which shows how the castle looked inside and outside when the Givens family lived there. Here is the study hall on the first floor. This is the east stairway landing near the front door. Here is the window in the dining room facing north. This is the library on the second floor. These are bedrooms on the third floor. Here is the art studio on the third floor. Notice the skylight. This is the basement. Likely on the northeast side is the tennis court. Here is a pool with a water fountain. This is a small bridge. Here are students on the grounds. In 1908, Given sold about half the property to the Horton family, all the lots except for four and five, which included the castle and a coach house. Givens then put up the remaining property for sale. In an advertisement, he noted the house had cost $30,000 and that the remaining property was worth $20,000. In January 1909, the castle and coach house were sold to the Burdett family for $20,000. J.B. Burdett was a manufacturer and inventor. One of his companies made a variety of products, including elevator parts and oxygen tanks. In 1915, he opened the Burdett Oxygen Company. Executive offices were in Chicago. J.B. and Jesse had one daughter. Esther Lucille, who was born in 1895 and thus was a teenager when the Burdettes moved into the castle. In January 1916, she was married to John J. McCormick in the castle. During their tenure in the castle, the Burdettes did add a beautiful porte cochere on the north side. They used it as a carport. They had a driveway laid from the rear of the castle running through the porte cochere and then around the front to 103rd Street and back westward to the rear. They added hot water radiators inside and wired the castle for electricity. J.B. and Jesse were early automobile enthusiasts. J.B. designed and built race cars as a hobby. In the early 1900s, automobiles with gasoline, steam, and electric engines were competing. Automobiles were then called machines or horseless carriages. In 1901, the Joliet Automobile Club sponsored a 40-mile race from Chicago to the Joliet Courthouse. J.B. and Jesse won this race with a time of 1 hour, 49 minutes, and 18 seconds. They drove a Winton automobile and received a congratulatory letter from the Winton Motor Carriage Company, one of the first American car manufacturers. 
Jessie rode shotgun in that race and was credited with helping her husband win it. The Chicago Inner Ocean newspaper headline with Mrs. Burdett finishes with machine on fire. The automobile's entry as a mode of transportation was not wholeheartedly welcomed. Early machines were seen as dangerous. In 1904, J.B. appeared at the Lombard, Illinois courthouse, which was crowded with spectators. He had been charged with speeding, going 12 miles an hour through the town. J.B. claimed he traveled at no more than 8 miles an hour. Two witnesses, one a farmer and the other a traveling salesman, had set up a speed trap. The second witness supposedly measured the vehicle's time and distance traveled to determine its speed by standing a quarter mile from the first witness who fired a gun as soon as the Burdett's vehicle passed him. In the end, J.B. was found not guilty. Living on the hill along Longwood Boulevard was a privilege for the Burdettes and the other homeowners. In 1912, Longwood Boulevard's name was changed to Longwood Drive, and it was officially designated for pleasure driving only. J.B. was on the newly created Longwood Drive Association. A 1912 sign indicated that traffic teams and funerals were not allowed. In 1909, the Ridge Country Club, which was then located on several acres around Levitt, just south of 103rd Street, sponsored a jousting match as that year's annual fair. Jessie Burdett appeared in the Chicago Daily Tribune. She was shown seated in a Japanese garden scene at the fair. An image discovered in a trunk by members of the Burdett family, collection of Suzanne McCormick Savage, shows knights in shining armor in front of the castle, which could have been part of that same fair. Other images of the castle show how the building looked during the Burdett tenure. J.B. died in 1942. Esther's husband, John J. McCormick, then became president of the Burdett Oxygen Company, which existed through 1975 when it was sold. The Siemens family was the fourth castle keeper from 1921 to 1942. Miroslav was born in what is now the Ukraine, while Bonnie was of Irish Catholic heritage. The children included Miroslav Jr., Roman, James, and Patricia. Miroslav was one of the first physicians of Ukrainian descent to immigrate to the United States. He graduated in 1913 from Bennett Medical College, affiliated with Loyola University School of Medicine in Chicago. He was a physician at Roseland Community Hospital for many years and kept an office in the castle. Miroslav's father, Nicholas Simonovich, was a Ukrainian Catholic priest who rose to Monsignor. Both Miroslav's father and mother, Maria Magdalene, lived in the castle with the family and basically raised their grandchildren. Reverend Simonovich had a chapel built in the southeast tower on the third floor. Bonnie's mother, Margaret Brannan, stayed with the family for months at a time and helped raise the children. A couple blocks north of the castle on Longwood Drive stood the original St. Barnabas Church, Built in 1924, it housed an elementary school for the few neighborhood Catholic families living in the community at that time. Prejudice against Catholics was common then. Miroslav Jr. was about 10 years old when he decided to attend the Catholic school rather than Sutherland School, the local public school he had been attending. Miroslav Sr. was actively involved in the Ukrainian community and in helping Ukrainians in their homeland. 
In 1917, he was part of a delegation that met with President Wilson to ask that the president establish a tag day to raise money to help Ukrainian widows and orphans. The delegation was successful. President Wilson issued a proclamation to that effect. They were able to collect nearly $70,000, worth about $1.4 million in 2017. Miroslav Sr. also served as chair of the Ukrainian exhibit at the Century of Progress World's Fair held in Chicago in 1933 and 1934. At the time, the Ukraine was not a sovereign state. More than two million people visited the pavilion. In 1952, he was also a founder of the Ukrainian National Museum in Chicago. Even before then, he wanted to collect and to preserve Ukrainian history. He was also a benefactor of St. Nicholas Catholic Church before it became a cathedral. The Siemens family occupied the castle from 1921 until 1942, when they had to sell it because of financial difficulties and the Great Depression of the 1930s. The fifth and present castle keeper is Beverly Unitarian Church. In 1942, Beverly Unitarian Fellowship, as it was known then, bought the castle from the Siemens family. The church is the longest keeper of the castle. The beginning of BUC, as the church is often called, goes back to the 1870s. In 1874, people of Universalist and Unitarian religions held services together in Englewood, Illinois, which did not become part of Chicago until 1890. Unitarians and Universalists merged in 1961 to become the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations which has evolved into a religious organization that accepts people of different beliefs while retaining an appreciation of its Judeo-Christian heritage. BUC is a member of the organization. The flaming chalice is the organization's symbol, denoting religious freedom, enlightenment, justice, and truth. The first minister was Florence Kulik, beginning in 1878. She was a Universalist minister who did missionary work in Englewood. Her sermons were so inspirational, she had as many men as women in the pews on any given Sunday, which was highly unusual. She increased the membership of the church, so much so that in 1889 the members built a second church, the Stewart Avenue Universalist Church. It was later to be called People's Liberal Church. She had about 400 regular parishioners and 300 children in the Sunday school. She was for equal treatment of all people. For example, in wedding ceremonies, she took out the word obey. In Reverend Colick's congregation was a young Clarence Darrell, who had become a famous lawyer, known to most people for the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, in which Darrell made the case that the Bible should not be interpreted word for word and that teaching evolution in the schools was appropriate. Reverend Colick resigned in 1892. She wanted to see the Holy Land and study abroad. Her congregation asked her to select a successor. She chose Reverend Rufus White, who would serve the church for over 40 years, Reverend White also believed character was more important than creed. He had the church renamed People's Liberal Church when the Universalist leadership complained he wasn't following the Universalist tenet by teaching that all people were saved. For White, what was religious was doing anything that was good. He started the Penny Saving Society, in which school children were able to save their pennies, nickels, and dimes that could be affixed to cards and recorded as savings accounts in a bank. In the eight years the program was run, they managed to save over $300,000, which in 2016 would be worth $7,740,000. 
Reverend White was a master mason who achieved honorary degrees, including the highest, the 33rd degree. He went on trips all over the world to photograph and learn about other cultures. His trips abroad were sponsored by Medina Temple and by the church. He would give travel lectures using a stereopticon, a forerunner of moving pictures, whereby each image would dissolve into another one. Thousands of people attended the lectures at Medina Temple on Sunday afternoons and the same lectures at the church on Sunday evenings, as well as at many other locations. In 1907, he even gave a travel lecture at Bethany Union Church near the castle. Perhaps Robert and Emma Givens were in attendance. For Reverend White's 25th anniversary as pastor of People's Liberal Church, the congregation took on a worthy project that became Oak Haven Old People's Home, a nursing home for seniors. Construction of the building at 113th and Western Avenue in the Morgan Park neighborhood began in 1922. At the same time, Reverend White and his family moved into the community. He became the first president while Susie Woodman, a church member, became field secretary. Church members raised $60,000, and later White was able to acquire the $1.75 million estate of Emily Smith for the facility. That would be worth over $25 million in 2017. The home was expanded several times and is now called Smith Village, White was considered an eloquent speaker, and he gave lectures over the radio in the 1920s. After Reverend White died in 1937, People's Liberal Church member Clara Nieberger designed a bronze plaque in his honor. In the 1930s, Clara and husband Ed were living in the Beverly Morgan Park community. Her family was reluctant to attend the church so far away in Englewood. She got permission to start a study group in her home. In October 1941, the first Unitarian service was held in the basement of the Nieberger home. Reverend Donald Harrington, the minister of People's Liberal Church, conducted the first service. One day when Reverend Harrington, his wife Vilma, and Clara were driving along Longwood Drive, they saw the castle. Reverend Harrington said it would make a fine church, and Clara chimed in that it was for sale. They parked the car and knocked on the side entrance. They were surprised to be met by a Ukrainian Catholic priest, Miroslav Siemens' father. They were told the Siemens family had to sell the castle, and they could have it for $14,000. Clara started the campaign for the castle. She enlisted Dr. Preston Bradley to be the honorary campaign chairman. Church leader W. Glenn Southers helped acquire the property. The new name for the church was Beverly Unitarian Fellowship, and the membership held the first service in the castle in spring 1942. Clara, also an artist, made a drawing of the first floor of the castle in 1942. Reverend Harrington wrote a short story about the night after Christmas in the castle. In 1951, People's Liberal Church merged with Beverly Unitarian Fellowship and brought one of the pews, which is now in the sanctuary. Also in 1951, the Visser family became castle caretakers and moved into the building. They also became members of the fellowship. Son Rudy Visser reminisced about his family in living August in the of 1951. We had an opportunity to move into this building as caretakers. We always referred to it as the castle. Uh, sometimes, uh, of course, the Beverly Unitarian Fellowship Church. I don't know whether we really ever said that this was this was our house you know, our residence. In fact, a lot of people didn't believe that we lived in a castle. Certainly our relatives overseas in, in the Netherlands didn't believe it. <laughs> in 1952, a renovation of the interior of the castle included taking down the walls that had separated the living room, dining room, and reception hall. During the winter, children in the neighborhood would slide down the castle hill which was steeper at that time. 
in 1953, Jews living in the community decided to establish a congregation and to build a synagogue in the neighborhood. However, from 1953 to 1961, they met in the castle. The congregation was called Beth Torah, or Temple of Learning. The first bar mitzvah took place in the castle in 1954. Alan Goldberg's speech was so short that Rabbi Daniel Silver put his arm around him and told the congregation, Welcome to the Jet Age. In 1956, Rabbi Silver and the congregation were featured on a TV program called Faith of Our Fathers, which was at the same time as the Ed Sullivan Show. The minister of Beverly Unitarian Church from 1951 to 1963, while the Vissers were caretakers, was Vincent Silliman. He is considered a famous Unitarian Universalist. He edited several songbooks, which are still being used. He also co-edited a book on marriage. Reverend Silliman and Rabbi Leonard Devine of Beth Torah became good friends and gave sermons to each other's congregation. Eventually, in 1957, the Beverly Unitarian Fellowship, called Fellowship because of a Chicago ordinance that required churches to have a higher ceiling than that in the castle, became Beverly Unitarian Church. In the late 1950s, the church considered tearing down the castle and building a modern edifice on the site. There were over 100 children in the Sunday school. It was decided to build an addition later called the Children's Edition, that would include classrooms and a church office. This required the removal of the port cocher. The addition was completed in spring 1960, and the first classes were held in September 1960. Diversity was prized by the congregation. Church members created a non-sectarian preschool that still exists today as the Beverly Castle Academy. Helen Malavides was the owner and director for many years. Kelly Seiss, who became owner and director more recently, recalled how the children call the school the castle or my castle whenever they see it. In the early 1980s, the castle was renovated by church members to make it a more suitable space while maintaining its medieval appearance on the outside. The restoration was called Chrysalis and was led by Les O'Rear, a member and a famous labor historian. Members and friends of the church spent about 15,000 hours on the renovation and about $150,000. When community members think about the castle, they often think of the annual Christmas tree sale, which was started in the early 1960s by the men of the castle. A newer function is Breakfast with Santa. For the community, the church also hosts discussions on current hot-button topics such as poverty, crime, and recidivism, and organizes a recycling program. Being a castle that's over 125 years old lends itself to legends and ghost stories. You cannot convince people who believe in ghosts to change their perceptions. The book, Chicago's Only Castle, discusses a number of these stories. People who have seen the castle have been inspired by it and have had their photographs taken in front of it. Over the years, the castle has had five keepers the Givens family, Julia Thayer and the Chicago Female College, the Burdett family, the Siemens family, and Beverly Unitarian Church. In 1981, the Chicago Landmarks Commission officially designated the Longwood Drive District, which includes the castle, as a landmark. In the section of the Chicago Landmarks website, called Details for Building at 10244 South Longwood Drive, it is listed as a Tudor Revival style residence. It is also located in the Ridge Historic District, identified as such 
on the National Park Service's National Register of Historic Places. It was on the Beverly Area Planning Association's home tours of 1986 and 2015. Hopefully the castle will be on the 2036 tour when it will be 150 years old. During the celebration of the building of the Children's Annex on May 15, 1960, the congregation sang the Builder's Creed, written by John Ruskin in 1849, while Ruth Walls, longtime member of People's Liberal Church, Beverly Unitarian Fellowship, and Beverly Unitarian Church, played the music on the piano. When we build, let us think we build forever. Let it not be for present delight, nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for, and let us think, as we lay stone on stone, that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them, and that people will say, as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, See, this our fathers did for us. Thank you.